Okay. Are we live? Mm -hmm. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm going right now to share our live thing. However I do that. I never do it right the first time. I pray that everyone's having a good day. It's good to be back. Back from vacation. We had a wonderful trip. Uh, I don't know if y'all saw it or not, but we got to play with monkeys. <laughs> and that was super cool. <clears throat> pray, play with some sloths. We had... Uh, we tried to bring one back for Stephanie, but uh, unfortunately, it, we couldn't get it through customs. So, but uh, but no, we had a great time. It was good to get away, good to uh, break away for a little bit. Hey, Katie. Hey, Brittany and Dan. Daniel, I'm sorry I missed your call today. I will call you back after Bible study. Um, but anyway, I hope everyone's doing well. It is now 7 o'clock in Johnson City, Tennessee, so let's open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time where we can gather and where we can just share your holy word, Lord. Lord, we, we thank you for the technology that allows us to come together. Lord, we thank you for the fellowship that, that want, makes us want to come together, Lord. We thank you for the love of Christ that you've instilled in us that makes us want to grow to know you better, that makes us want to come to know your holy word, Lord. And Lord, we pray that we're the obedient servants that you designed us to be, Lord. May each and every one of us search long and hard for the purpose that you've put before us, Lord. May we be stewards of the faith as you have commanded us, Lord. And may we always seek you in all things, Lord, understanding that you are the only pathway to peace, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the peace that you have granted us. We thank you for the lessons that we learn. We thank you for the hard times that, that sharpen us, Lord. And we thank you for the, for the successful times, Lord, that allow us to glorify you, Lord. Let us glorify you more and more each and every day, Lord. Let us understand that you are a God of love, a God of compassion, a God of reason. And you want to see your people happy, Lord. But we can only be happy through obedience and through understanding. Let us... Let us gain understanding today. Let us apply it to our lives. Let us become more obedient through your holy word. And let us learn the lessons that you have established since the beginning of time, Lord, so that we may obtain that peace that we so desire. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Amen. Sorry, I've got a dog trying to get on this tripod. Quit. Uh, special prayer request today. Just got it in. Um, be in prayer for Haley's Nana. Uh, she's going to see her now. Her name is Shirley. Um, she's in the hospital, not really sure what's going on, but she had open heart surgery a couple years ago. So, um, we know that it's always touch and go, but we also know, uh, that she is a woman of faith, that she is, uh, she is in God's grace and in God's mercy and that healing will be given to her. Um, but let's pray for Haley. Let's pray for the family. Let's pray for her. Let's pray for the doctors. Let's pray for all of those that are that are surrounding her, Lord, so that they may remain faithful. Um, because doubt is contagious. Yes. Doubt is contagious. So um, we had a week off last week. I asked that everyone read chapters 40 and 41 uh, by a show of hands. How many people read it? <laughs> I don't see any hands. Um, <laughs> Well, <laughs> the good news is I read it, <laughs> and uh, and I am prepared. I, this, I, 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 you're going to hear me say it so many times, especially if you stick with this Bible study uh, and we go through the entire Bible. You're going to hear me say so many times, this is one of my favorite sections of Scripture. Mm -hmm. But this is one of my favorite sections of Scripture. <laughs> um, I love the story of Joseph, and I love the way that his life mirrors the life of Christ. I love the way that, that God uses him in mighty ways. Um, I love the lessons that he learns. I love the, the way that uh, the way that he pours out his faith. Um, you know, we always hear about having faith like Daniel and the lions did. We talk about having, uh, the, you know, the faith of a mustard seed or having the faith of so many people. And, and we know the story of Joseph because it is so enriching but we don't hear people say having the faith like Joseph. And, and Joseph was, was extremely faithful. I mean, let, let's look at what's happened to him so far. He was a little brat. Um, he was the, 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 the favorite of all his father's children. 
Um, he, he had a dream and he spoke it out loud and he, he said that he, he dreamt that all his brothers and even his father would bow down to him. The brothers laughed at him, but, but uh, Jacob, knowing the dreams that he had had and the, the, the prophecies that God had instilled in his heart, he kept these things in the back of his mind. Now, prior to that, uh, Joseph had made, or I'm sorry, Jacob had made Joseph a coat of many, many colors. Um, his other brothers didn't get that, and they were they were jealous of him. They they really thought that he was just a little brat. And um, our dog's being a little brat right now. <laughs> so anyway, they thought he was a little brat, and uh, he went out to check on him. And his brothers wanted to kill him. His brothers wanted to to end his life, and they had an opportunity to do it. Um, but we see that, uh, that, that Judah stepped up and took a leadership role and said, hey, let's not kill him, let's sell him. Um, so they sold him into slavery. So he's a slave in Egypt. And uh, he's, he's in a powerful household, the, the captain of the, of the king's guard. And uh, he's accused of making advances at, the, at, at, the, at his wife. So he's thrown into prison. Um, so he goes from Potiphar's house to prison, um, and when he gets into prison, he's shown favor there too. He was given all of the, the power of Potiphar's house. Uh, he was then put into prison, and he was given responsibility after responsibility in prison because he had a good head on his shoulders. That's one of the things that we can really learn from Joseph, um, and we're, we're really going to see it come even more into focus in chapters 40 and 41. Um, if anything, Joseph had a good head on his shoulders. Um, I mean, it says that he was attractive. You, you can see, obviously, that he was faithful. But he used his mind. And, uh, you know, so many times we focus on the heart and we focus on the spirit and we forget about the mind. Um, God says to love him with all your heart all of your soul, and all of your mind. And, and mind is put in there for a reason, because your mind is important. You can't be 100% spirit-led, because if you're 100% spirit-led, you have to use your mind. It is an equal share. You have to be led by the Spirit. You have to be able to discern with your mind. You have to be able to, to, to listen to your heart and decipher whether your heart is telling you the right thing or the wrong thing. So, your mind is very, very important in God's eyes, uh, just like the rest of you is. So anyway, here we are. Joseph has been given authority in, in prison, and um, there's two very special prisoners in there. Ah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the king's cupbearer and the king's baker. Now... What we have to understand about the, the pharaohs of the time, they were very um, extravagant. That's what we'll say. I mean, uh, you know, of the relics that they found from this time period, um, and you see it depicted in movies all the time. They wore the gold. Uh, they wore the fancy linen robes. Uh, they, they had killer tans. Um, I'm just kidding. They were they, they're of a darker complexion than, than a Caucasian, um, but they uh, they had big fancy houses. They they were very elaborate. Um, at this time, you know, Egypt was the hub. So you know, when people came into Egypt, Egypt was just magnificent. Mm -hmm. You know, they had the palaces, and it was just, it was all decked out. So, you know, there was every position that you could think of the, the pharaoh would have had. Um, you know, the cupbearer. What, what is a cupbearer? The cupbearer literally handed the, the <laughs> pharaoh his cup and kept his cup full of whatever beverage he wanted to drink that day. Mm -hmm. um, the baker. The baker was in charge of making... The, the Pharaoh, whatever baked goods that he wanted. So Pharaoh, um, they were also very, uh, very finicky. And you can actually see this lead into the, the leaders of Rome as well. You know, if, if you burnt Pharaoh's cookies, you could go to jail. So um, it was almost like an any cause situation. 
So um, here he is, he's in jail, and, and chapter 40 starts out with verse 1. It says, After this, the king of Egypt's cupbearer and the baker offended their master, the king of Egypt. What did they do to offend him? I don't know. Maybe there was sour wine. Maybe he burned his cookies. It doesn't really say. But it says that Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put him in the custody of the house of the captain of the guards in the prison where Joseph was, Joseph was confined. The captain of the guards assigned Joseph to them as their personal attendant. And they were in the custody for some time. So these two men were put into prison and they obviously held high positions in Pharaoh's household. Personal contact with Pharaoh. And they were put in the custody of Joseph. Joseph was in charge of these two men. And it says, The king of Egypt's cupbearer and baker who were confined in the prison each had a dream. Both of them had a dream on the same night. Each dream had its own meaning. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they looked distraught. So he asked Pharaoh's officers, who were in custody with him in his master's house, Why do you look so sad today? So Joseph, who's spending time with these men, he's getting to know these men, and, and you can see that Joseph, um, Joseph was very discerning. You know, a lot of times, uh, I don't know how many people have been in a prison or been in a jail environment, but those that are in charge of the prisoners could really care less about the people that they're put in charge of. Um, they're there to do a job. They're there to guard the prisoners. They're there to uh, tend to the prisoners' needs, but they don't care if you're having a bad day. I mean, if you've ever been in jail, very rarely does a prison guard ask you, are you having a bad day? What's wrong? Why the long face today, Scott? Um, so Joseph is not one of those people. Joseph obviously cares. Joseph obviously understands that these men are going through something. So he asked them, and, and that, that shows Joseph's nature. Um, if you want to see a, a, a unique look at that relationship, um, there is actually a, a documentary called The Stanford Experiment in which some people were given a position of prison guard, some people were given a position of prisoner, and it was just an experiment. It was all pretend, and the, the people who were assigned the position of guards were extremely abusive. So this is out of human nature. This is out of the norm. Joseph is not taking advantage of his position. He is taking it seriously. What does that say? When we're given a position, when we're blessed with a position by God, because he has been blessed with this position of, of being a steward over these two men, we are to be good stewards. He's showing good stewardship. God has blessed him. God has given him responsibility. And Joseph, in turn, takes that responsibility serious in every aspect. So they say, we had dreams, I say to him, but no one can interpret them. And then Joseph said to them, don't interpretations belong to God? Yeah. So immediately, Joseph, and we'll see this again in Daniel. When Daniel interprets dreams, he always gives glory to God. Mm -hmm. Joseph knows that he has the, the ability to interpret dreams because he has seen his own dreams. He hasn't seen them come to fruition, but he understands that God has blessed him with that gift of prophecy and he is giving the glory to God. And then he says, tell me your dreams. So he's saying, you tell me your dreams and I will give them to God. I will give them to the one true God. And I will be able to tell you through the, the abilities that he has given me. So the chief cupbearer told him his dream. In my dream, there was a vine in front of me. On the vine, there were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossoms, came out. And its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. So I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Joseph said, this is the interpretation. The three branches are three days. In just three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position. You will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand the way you used to when you were his cupbearer. But when all goes well for you, remember that I was with you. Please show kindness to me by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. For I was kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, I've done nothing that they should put me in a dungeon. So Pharaoh receives this dream from the cupbearer. 
He interprets it according to God's will, according to what God has shown him. And he asks, he says, in return, remember me. Because he knows, he has faith that what God is telling him is true. And he has faith that this man is going to be restored and he's going to be right at the right hand of Pharaoh, filling that cup constantly. And um, so he gives the interpretation according to God's will. Why is this important? Just remember that he, 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 he interprets this dream favorably because I want to get into the next section here and we'll compare and contrast. And it says, When the chief baker saw the interpretation was positive, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. So the chief baker is like, hmm, do I really want this guy to interpret my dream? And then he sees a favorable interpretation and immediately... He says, oh, okay, well, that was favorable, so I'm going to tell you my dream. And it says, I also had a dream. Three baskets of, of white bread were on my head. In the top basket were all sorts of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is the interpretation, Joseph replied. The three baskets are three days, just like the three days that he had said to um, the cupbearer. He says, in just three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from off of you and hang you on a tree. Then the birds will eat the flesh from your body. So, we see that no matter what the interpretation is, Joseph delivers what God has given him. Keep this in your mind. Because prophecy, prophecy is, um, prophecy is, 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 is receiving these these dreams and being able to interpret these dreams and, and being able to do the, do it accurately. But when we get later on in the in the Old Testament, what we're going to see is we're going to see that there were people that carried the title of um, carried the title of prophet or, or hung it on themselves in some instances, and they would only deliver a favorable message, no matter what God was delivering, so that they would find favor with man mm -hmm. and not with God. Mm -hmm. See, now Joseph, he delivers this message, and again, this is a show of faith. Because if this man is restored, if Joseph's interpretation is wrong, Joseph may end up being killed. Because this man, just like the cupbearer, is going to be with Pharaoh all the time. And he can say, there's a false prophet among us. And Pharaoh would handle it accordingly. So um, Joseph, again, is demonstrating his faith by delivering what God has given him directly to this baker. And the baker is going to literally lose his head. And it says, on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he gave a great feast. For all of his servants, he elevated the chief cupbearer and the chief baker among his servants. Pharaoh restored the chief cupbearer to his position as cupbearer, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But Pharaoh hanged the chief baker, just as Joseph explained to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Joseph asked for a favor for delivering the interpretation and the cupbearer showed that, hey, you know, I'm going to look out for me and uh, forget you. There's an important lesson there, too. Um, Joseph delivered the message that God laid on his heart. Joseph delivered the message that was put into his mind. Joseph shared the truth with this man. And this man chose not to remember Joseph. This man chose to ignore Joseph. Later on in Scripture, we're going to see another man come and deliver the message of God to many people. Mm -hmm. And many people are going to turn their backs on that man and forget about him. Not only are they going to forget about him, they're going to send him to a cross, and he is going to die for your sins. Mm -hmm. This is yet another instance where the life of Joseph is mirroring the life of Christ. We can see that Joseph... Delivering the message that God has instilled in him, the message that God wants him to deliver, yet he is forgotten by the very one that he was supposed to deliver it to. 
So just keep that in your mind. Um, and uh, that leads us into chapter 41. So we've seen Joseph in, in several instances have dreams, interpret dreams, and be accurate in the interpretation. Now remember that dream that's been held back, the one that the brothers scoffed at, the ones that the brothers said, he's such a brat. I can't believe that he's saying that he's going to be above us and he's going to be above our, our father, our dad, not our heavenly father. He's going to be above our dad. And while they're do, saying all this, Jacob's like, I'm putting that in the back of my head. Because mm -hmm. Jacob knew. Jacob knew that there may be some merit to Joseph's dream. Now, I mean, I'm sure that he was like, what a little brat. Because remember, Jacob was a brat too. Um, so at the end of two years, so this is two years later. The cupbearer has been restored for two years. He hadn't said a thing about Joseph. Thing about Joseph. But Joseph, hey, Joseph is just, he's there. He knows that there's a purpose for him. He knows that he is... Uh, he is meant to do something. And it says, at the end of two years, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing beside the Nile when seven healthy-looking, well-fed cows came up from the Nile and began to graze among the reeds. After them, other cows, sickly and thin, came up from the Nile and stood beside those cows along the bank of the Nile. The sickly, thin cows ate, healthy, ate the healthy, well-fed cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep. And dreamed the second time. Seven heads of grain, plump and good, came up from one stalk. After them, seven heads of grain, thin and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up. The thin heads of grain swallowed the, the lump, the, the plump full ones. Then Pharaoh woke up, and it was only a dream. When the morning came, he was troubled, so he summoned all the magician, uh, magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. Let's go back to chapter 40, verse 8. Don't interpretations belong to God? So he summoned all these wise men, all these magicians, all these people that supposedly had all these mystic powers, uh, um, and they could not tell him anything. Yet, through God, those dreams could be interpreted. Now let's talk about prophecy for just a second here. Prophecy. Prophecy, delivering the message of God. Now, it's a different look on prophecy now, but the delivering of God's message through, through the proper interpretation is prophecy. Mm-hmm. So if you really get into your Bible, if you really get into finding the proper interpretation, if you truly get into God's Word and you sink your teeth into it, you digest it, and you share it, you are prophesying for God. You are sharing God's message. You are sharing the truth of God's Word. Joseph didn't have that. See, so many times we, 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 we feed into false prophecy. We feed into the, the, the Hagees of the world that come out and say, hey, the end of the world is going to be this year. We feed into the, <laughs> to the guys on, on, on TBN at, at 3 in the morning that are telling us that, that you know, this is going to happen if you, if, you, if you say this certain prayer or if you do this or you do that. Truth of the matter is, the truth to those questions, the answer to those questions lie in Scripture. No one knows when the world is going to end. No one knows. So that's a false prophecy because God's word tells us that no one knows. We don't, we don't serve a genie in a bottle. So God's word tells us that our blessings are according to God's will, not according to our will. Because he knows our abilities, he knows our capabilities, he knows, he knows our, 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 our desire to serve, he knows our ability to use those blessings properly. So he's not going to just bless you out of the blue because you ask for it. So those guys are delivering false prophecies. Prophecy is in God's word. God's truth is in these very pages. And um, 
So, you know, prophecy is still alive today. If you were delivering the true gospel, if you were delivering God's true message, that you were prophesying for him. Mm -hmm. A prophecy does not have to be some type of dream interpretation. It doesn't have to be something magnificent. And not that God's word is not magnificent, but when I say magnificent, something that we concoct in our head because God's word is magnificent enough to stand on its own. We don't have to add to it. And if we're adding to it, we are damned. And that's from Scripture too. So be careful what you share. Be careful how you share it. I'm going to go into uh, a, false, uh, a false interpretation of Scripture here in a few chapters. Not a few chapters. A, a few verses. But so we see that, that, that they come... Interpretations belong to God. And then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, Today I remember my faults. Pharaoh was angry with his servants, and he put me and the chief baker in the custody of the captain of the guards. He and I had dreams on the same night. Each dream had its own meaning. Now a young Hebrew, a slave of the captain of the guards, was with us there. We told him of our dreams, he interpreted our dreams for us, and each had his own interpretation. It turned out just the way he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was hanged. Then Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and they quickly brought him from the dungeon. He shaved, changed his clothes, and went into Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and no one can interpret it, but I have heard it said that you can... Hear my dream and interpret it. This is awesome. Joseph said, I am not able to. It is God who will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Let's go to 40, verse 8. Don't interpretations belong to God. This was an opportunity for Joseph, if he wanted to, to put himself onto a pedestal. To say, Yes, Pharaoh, I can interpret your dreams. Yes, it is I, Joseph, who is the great dream interpreter. It is I, Joseph, who, who needs to receive praise and honor. But no, he didn't do that. He gave glory to God. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, In my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile when seven well-fed, healthy-looking cows came up from the Nile and grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows weak, very sickly and thin, came up. I've never seen such sickly ones as, as these in all the land of Egypt. Then the thin, sickly cows ate the first seven well-fed cows. When they had devoured them, you could not tell that they had devoured them. Their appearance was as bad as it had been before. Then I woke up. In my dream, I also saw seven heads of grain, full and good, coming up on one stalk. After them, seven heads of grain with withered, thin, and scorched by the east wind sprouted up. The thin heads of grain swallowed the seven good ones. I told this to the magicians, but no one could tell me what it means. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams mean the same thing. Er, okay, so we talk about it in, in other parts of Scripture. We talk about it throughout, uh, throughout the Bible. If something is mentioned twice, it is probably important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so God has put this dream in Pharaoh's head, not once, but twice. So God is sending a message to Pharaoh, even though Pharaoh doesn't understand it, even though Pharaoh can't interpret it. God knows that he is going to have to send it back to God in order for him to receive a real interpretation. Joseph is that vessel in which God has chosen to use. And Joseph says that, that they mean the same thing. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Notice that he didn't say, I am going to reveal to you what is about to happen. He says, God has revealed. God had already revealed to Pharaoh what was going to happen. Pharaoh just had to be able to understand it. We'll hit the brakes again. A lot of people look at Scripture. A lot of people look at the Bible. I used to be one of them. And they try to pick it apart. They try to tear it down. And they try to poke holes in, in, in the inerrant, infallible, uh, inspired word of God. It ain't going to happen. There is no hole. There is no weakness. There is not a weak link in this chain of the words that God has given us. 
However, as I said, many will try. Why? Because they don't understand. Unless you are endowed with the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. in which Joseph was endowed with the Holy Spirit at this time, you will not understand what God is telling you. You have to have the Holy Spirit, which is fully God, in order to interpret Scripture. If not, what happens? You apply an earthly standard, an earthly read, an earthly uh, uh, way of measuring, an earthly census, an earthly look at God's Word. And in an earthly way, yes, God's Word does not make sense. Why? Because on the earth, in, in an earthly way, we teach we teach evolution. We don't teach creation. In, in, a, in a worldly sense, we, we don't understand the lifespans at the beginning of Genesis. In an earthly sense, we cannot wrap our heads around or fathom a resurrection from the dead. Um, in an earthly sense, we can't understand the love that Christ had for his creation and his people. Because that's not an earthly view. Until we are endowed with the Holy Spirit, we are just as blind to, as Pharaoh to what God is trying to tell us. It is a wonderful gift that he has given us. And it says the seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads are seven years. The dreams mean the same thing. The seven thin, sickly cows came up after them are seven years, and the seven worthless scorched heads of grain are seven years of famine. So God is telling Pharaoh what? Well, verse 28, it says, It is just as I told Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt. After them, seven years of famine will take place, and all the abundance in the land of Egypt will be forgotten. We have to understand the position of Egypt again. Context, 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 context. Okay, a famine hitting Egypt of this magnitude would have wiped out Egypt. God is literally saying, I am God. I am going to save you. Listen to what I am telling you. And... Coming from Joseph, they can see that it's true. But this would not have just affected Egypt. This would have been like New York City being annihilated. Imagine what would have had what would happen to uh, to 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 the United States or California falling into the sea. Imagine the celebration. And uh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, but. Uh, no, it, it would have been devastating, not just to Egypt, but to really all of the world at that time. So this is God saying, you are my creation. This is what I'm about to do. You need to listen to this man. And it says, the famine will devastate the land. The abundance of the land will not be remembered because of the famine that follows it. For the famine will be very severe. Since the dream was given twice to Pharaoh, it means that the matter has been determined by God and he will carry it out soon. So, again, that importance that we see repeating itself in Scripture, if we see something twice, we probably want to pull out our, our yellow, pink, blue, purple, whatever color you use, our highlighter, and highlight those things because they're important. It comes down to proper interpretation again. So now... Let Pharaoh look for discerning and wise men. Ooh, discerning. People that use their mind to interpret whether something is good or bad. And set them over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this. Let him appoint overseers over the land and take a fifth of the harvest of the land uh, of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. Let them gather all the excess food during these good years that are coming. Under Pharaoh's authority, store the grain in the city so that they may preserve it as food. The food will be a reserve for the land during the seven years of famine that will take place in the land of Egypt. Then the country will not be wiped out by the famine. So not only, not only does God deliver the interpretation, God delivers the solution. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, and it's laid right there at Pharaoh's feet. Yeah. And, uh, and Pharaoh now has the option of taking it or leaving it. And, you know, 
we, we saw and we just talked about how there are people that won't see the truth of God's word. But then there's others, others that we talk to, others that we share the prophecy that is inside this book. Their eyes will be opened. And again, it's not us. This is not Joseph. This is the Lord. He will use you as a vessel to deliver the truth of Scripture if you are a willing vessel. You have to be willing. Mm -hmm. Notice that Joseph... Think about this. <laughs> Joseph, a Hebrew slave that has been imprisoned is standing in front of the most powerful human on earth at this point. A Hebrew slave. Standing in front of a man that could just lop off his head with the snap of a finger. Yet Joseph is not scared. Joseph is not nervous. Joseph is bold. Joseph delivers the truth. And he lays it in front of Pharaoh without thinking twice. And Pharaoh sees the truth that Joseph is speaking. Mm -hmm. And it says the proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And he said to them, can we find anyone like this man who has God's spirit in him? Mm -hmm. Pharaoh has now seen the spirit of God. Mm -hmm. Pharaoh has now seen that God delivers blessings and that God is delivering truth through this man. Mm -hmm. And what happens to Joseph? And he said, so Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one as discerning and as wise as you are. You will be over my house and all my people will obey your commands. Only I as king will be greater than you. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, see, I'm placing you over all the land in Egypt. Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, closed him with fine linen garments and placed a gold chain around his neck. Got some bling. <laughs> he had Joseph ride in his second chariot, and servants called out before him, Make way! So he placed him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and no one will be able to, to raise his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt without your permission. Mm. So Joseph, the Hebrew slave, who was imprisoned for adultery, becomes the second most powerful man in Egypt. Mm. And the truth of the matter is he was really the most powerful man in Egypt because God elevated him. And wh what can we see from Joseph? We can see faithfulness, a willingness to, to take his lumps, a willingness to take the hard times, yet still maintain his faith knowing that God's plan is bigger than any riches that he's been cheated out of, bigger than any, any uh, position that he may have lost because of his enslavement, anything that, that could have been harmful to him. He knew that God's plan was bigger, he knew that God's plan was greater, and he knew that God would not forget him. He always knew that God was with him in all that he did. Joseph continuously said, it is God, it is God, it is God, it is God. We, as people, get into the me complex too much. We get into the, I was cheated out of this, this was bad, this is unfair, this is that, this is that. No, life is unfair. Bad things happen, even if you think you're good. But if you are faithful, and if you are willing to make the sacrifices, and if you are willing to remain strong in your faith, God will reward you. He may not make you president of the United States. He may not make you the president of your company. He may not make you rich. He may not make you what you think you need to be. But he will make you what you were designed to be, mm -hmm. and you will be successful. That is success. Yes. That is success. So... Then Pharaoh gave Joseph a special name, and it's Zephanath Panah. Now, what does this mean? It means Savior of the World. Oh, mm. hello. So, uh, <laughs> pretty big title there. <laughs> so, uh, so he gave him that name, and, and he gave him Asimuth as a, as, a, as a wife, and that's the, the daughter of, 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 of Paphra the priest at on, 
And Joseph went through the out the land of Egypt. Now, okay, we don't know a whole lot about this wife. Now we know that that, that he was a pagan priest. So that's odd that Joseph would marry the 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 daughter of a pagan priest. We also will see a little bit later that uh, the covenant promise is not delivered through the children that were born to this woman either. So, um, because remember, the covenant promise is going to Judah. Mm -hmm. Joseph does a lot of great things. But Joseph also married a, a, a pagan a, a pagan priest's daughter. And, um, but one of the lies, or one of, the, I mean, it may not even be a lie, but one of the things of conjecture that you may hear, which is not backed up by scripture, it's not backed up by really any, any context whatsoever, but there are people that say that this is actually Donna's daughter, and she is being reunited with the family through marrying Joseph. Yes. That is, Where do you hear that? I've heard it As in his sister? Sources. Yeah, his sister's daughter through the rape. That, but like I said, there's no context for that because it doesn't say back there that she was pregnant from the rape. It doesn't say any of that stuff. So um, what, what I'm getting at is there's a lot of things out there right now that have a, a biblical background. <laughs> Jeff says she needs vetted. She does need that. I agree. I agree. Um, but uh, there's a lot of things out there that uh, that are not true. And some of these things you may see on TV. Uh, I can't remember what the name of that show is. There's a show out now, and it has a biblical basis, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have biblical truth. Mm -hmm. What they do is they take the characters and they add to them and, mm -hmm. and add, add dialogue and add all these things that just aren't true. So you'll get a partial truth, mm -hmm. but then you'll get you'll get a human interpretation or a human opinion on top of it. Guys, if it does not match scripture, it's it doesn't true. need to be in your head. Yep. Doesn't need to be in your head. People ask me all the time, well, what about the Gospel of Thomas? Hey, guess what? It wasn't canonized. Neither was the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, neither was the Gospel of Nicodemus, neither was uh neither was uh, many, many books, uh, the Apocrypha, there were many books that were not canonized. Now, does it mean that they're all lies? No, no. For example, the book of Thomas, which I just mentioned, it's the sayings of Jesus Christ is what it, it translates to. And you can find that Jesus said many of those things in Scripture, but some of them he didn't. So, you know, so it can't be canonized because it can't be verified. So if it can't be verified by Scripture or through someone that, that walked with Christ or through someone who was present at that time, it's not true. It's not true. That's why I wanted to bring that up. So, um, and, and so many times as, as Christians, what we do, or as disciples, is we are eager to learn. We are eager to, to you know, gain more knowledge. But we chase these things as opposed to chasing the truth that's been revealed. So if you truly want to get to know God's word, if you truly want to grow in it, what, you, what, what we should do is focus on the truth that's in Scripture. Now, Nikki did ask where I'd heard that from. Um, it was actually some uh, secular and Roman writings that put this out uh, later on. So, um, you know, not, not a very good source. So, in chapter or in, in verse 46 it says when Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh king of Egypt Joseph left Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout the land of Egypt so Joseph is now in charge of the land of Egypt he's second in command again let's look at Joseph and, and, and how seriously he took his responsibility again this is something that he was blessed with he is now over the land of Egypt now, many people, if they had gained this position at this time, what they would have done is they would have sat and they would have soaked up all the privileges that came with it and allowed uh, and not done the job that was at hand. But it says that, that he entered the service of Pharaoh and then he left Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout the land of Egypt. So Joseph 
is now taking this job, and he is going throughout the land of Egypt. And it says, during the seven years of abundance, the land produced outstanding harvest. Joseph gathered all the excess food in the land of Egypt during the seven years and put it in the cities. He put the food in every city from the fields around it. So Joseph stored up grain in such abundance like the, the sand of the sea. He stopped measuring it because it was beyond measure. So he's taking all of it. So, you know, we have that metropolis. We have that, that center point right there. And then of the cities, you know, like you've got New York and then you've got the suburbs, Chicago and the suburbs. So he's going into these outlaying areas and he's getting all the grain, grain and he's putting it in storehouses in the cities. Because he knows that the cities will be, it's more fortified in the cities. He has more um, tools in his hands so that he can protect these assets. Because this is an asset. This is the very life of the people around it. So if, if someone got greedy and wanted to you know, steal it, it, it would be a disaster for everyone. So, it says two sons were born to Joseph before the years of the famine arrived. Um... Now, these two kids, these two kids, they are a part of the uh, 12 tribes. It says, before the years of famine arrived, Asenath, the daughter of, of, of Potiphar, priest at On, bore them to him. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh. Mm -hmm. And he said, God has made me forget all my hardship mm -hmm. and my whole family. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Let's take our little highlighter and we'll just mark this right here. Okay, so, you know, God has made me forget all my hardship. Okay, so that's that's cool. That's cool. You know, we, we don't really forget our hardships. Um, you know, our hardships are, are memories, and our hardships are part of our testimony. Our hardships are part of how we glorify God. Mm -hmm. um, and... Let's just, you know, maybe, like I said, put a star next to verse 51, highlight the, the my whole family part right there, <laughs> because uh, I have a feeling that he hasn't forgotten his family. Let's see if I'm right. <laughs> and it says, that the, and the second son, he named Ephraim, and uh, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. So God blessed him. He was despised by his brothers. He was put in a hole, sold into slavery, put into a house where he, he gained a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of control, a little bit of power, a little bit of peace, so to say. And then he was falsely accused. He was imprisoned. He, he, he prophesied in prison. He was forgotten about in prison. Then he, he, he came out of prison, and he glorified God through the prophecies again. And God rewarded him with fertility in the very place that all of this hardship happened. And he was only 30. Yeah. He was a young man. Young man. Young man. It says, then the seven years of abundance in the land of Egypt came to an end. So, you know, Tree was saying, you know, he was 30. He was 30. He was. He was between the ages of 30 and 37 because he came into uh, this position at the age of 30, then the seven years of famine ended after his two sons were born. Mm -hmm. So he had these two sons between the ages of 30 and 37. Mm -hmm. So he was a young man. Young, young man. It says, then the seven years of abundance in the land of Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began, just as Joseph had said. There was famine in every land, but the whole land of Egypt, there was food. Mm -hmm. So Joseph's plan is working. Joseph is is is... He's his 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 smarts. He's using his head. He took the food and he stored it. It says, when the whole land of Egypt was stricken with famine, the people cried out to Pharaoh for their food. And Pharaoh told, Pharaoh told all of Egypt, go to Joseph and do whatever he tells you. <laughs> so Pharaoh, you know, Pharaoh saw that Joseph was blessed, saw that he was gifted, and he said, hey, leave me alone. I'm I'm I've got a cup and a. And a, and a Fresh cake in my hand. I'm gonna, I'm gonna chill out. You go talk to Joseph, okay? So, um, it says now the famine had spread across the whole region. So Joseph opened all the storehouses. So Joseph, Joseph takes all of this grain and he moves it from the the farmlands and he, he stores it in the cities. And then when the famine hits, he opens up the storehouse. 
<laughs> and sold the grain to the Egyptians. <laughs> Gonna make some money. Exactly. <laughs> Again, we see how smart Joseph is. Yeah. He knows that Pharaoh is coin operated. Pharaoh is all about the Benjamins. Pharaoh is all about the money. <laughs> all about the riches. So what does he do? He goes and collects the abundance from the farms surrounding the cities. The abundance of the farms that surround the cities. This wasn't even his grain to take. It belonged to the farmers. But he took the extra stuff, the stuff that was on the stocks, the stuff that they considered waste, and he took it and he put it in a storehouse and then he sold it back to the very people that he took it from. <laughs> I mean, do you not see the beauty in that? Genius. I mean, truly a genius. You know, and he's got to be laughing the whole time. He's like, I'm a Hebrew slave. <laughs> and it says, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Every land that came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain, for the famine was severe in every land. Joseph understood one of the primary principles of finance, the law of supply and demand. He understood that if he could build that supply while the abundance was there and the demand was low because there was plenty of food to go around. So he got that at a low cost, which was nothing. He took, he took the waste. He took the abundance. He took the stuff that was going to just sit on the, crowd, on, the on the vine and die. Yeah, can you explain that a little bit? So um, Jeff had a question about that. Sold that sold back what wasn't his. Yeah, it, the farmers, the farmers uh, grew all of these crops, right? So when you harvest a crop, there's always something left behind. There's always something left over. As a matter of fact, later on <laughs> when we get into when we when we get into talking about Ruth. That's what Ruth did. Remember, she went and she gleaned after they had gleaned and, and took what was left on the, on the vines, what was on the, on the crops. And that's what Joseph did. He had people go out and collect this stuff. And it became such an abundance in that seven years that he had enough to feed the entire land. But he didn't give it away. He sold it back to the people that he had gleaned after. So, you know... If you want to look at it in the technical sense, if I own a farm and I'm growing, let's say, tomatoes. Okay, so I, I harvest all my tomatoes, but I leave one tomato on every vine because they're just overlooked. And I'm not going to go back and collect that one tomato. They're going to die on the vine. Well, Joseph comes behind me and takes those tomatoes and puts them in a storehouse. And then there's worms and I can't grow tomatoes the next year but I love spaghetti so I go back to him and I buy those tomatoes those were really my tomatoes to begin with because he took them off of my vine so that's what Joseph did you see he took he told him in the dream to take one fifth of all of the thirst it's, we pay a tenth of our tithes mm -hmm. he only took a fifth of what they were producing and that fifth is what he put in the storehouse yeah, it, but it, you see, it wasn't a fifth from what they collected. It was a fifth that was left on the vine. Left on the vine. You know, God, God the Creator, knows exactly what's going to be left behind. Mm -hmm. He sees ahead of time. So Joseph is, is taking what's left on the vines and collecting it, and it becomes a huge abundance. Yeah. And uh, like I said, he understands supply and demand. These people didn't object to that, one, because Joseph was number two in power, right? Mm -hmm. And if they disagreed, he could have probably had them killed. Let's be honest. Mm -hmm. But secondly, they didn't complain about it because this stuff was just going to go to waste anyway. So it, it does also show stewardship. Mm, yeah. You know, we talk about how do we solve starvation? How do we do this? How do we do that? Well, we become good stewards of the things that we've been blessed with. We don't, we don't become wasteful. We, 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 we maintain the things that God has given us because God gives us enough. See, that's, that's another lesson that we see right there, and that's what we're going to close with is God always gives us enough. Whether or not we use the enough that he gives us, that's us. That's not God. We can't blame God for these things that happen. We can't blame God for the, for the, the starvation. We can't blame God for, for, for any of these things because God has given us the ability to handle these problems 
We just choose not to do it, whether it be out of greed, whether it be out of ignorance, whether it be out of pride, whatever it may be, we are the ones that choose not to use God's gifts the way that he meant. Amen. So um, with that, I will close. Um, do we have any questions, comments, or concerns? Well, yeah, I was reading Hebrews 11 today where um, it was talking about the faithful of those type of people, and Joseph was one of them, to the fact to where he was so faithful. Uh, he didn't see the promised land either, but um, he was so faithful in that promise that he told everyone when he died to take his bones to to Canaan, to the to the mm -hmm. land. So he was even up until he died, gave instructions going, okay, I may not, I'm not going to see this promise come to fruition, but I do know what's going to happen. So you go ahead and take my bones with you. Whenever it happens, you go, I mean, he, can you imagine saying that to somebody, go ahead and bury me now. But then when y'all go on to the promised land, then you make sure you take me with you. Take uh, that was hundreds of years before they even left. That's faith. <laughs> that is faith. That is faith. And, and hey, that's uh, Travis Shelton is absolutely correct. Waste not, want not. You begin to realize how much you waste when there's nothing left. Imagine those farmers learned a powerful lesson. Absolutely, because we see the beginning of this right here. And um, in, a, in a future chapter, we see that as the famine goes on, Joseph makes Pharaoh a very, very rich and powerful man because at the end of this famine, not only does this Pharaoh, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm spoiling it a little bit, but you know, read it and, and, and check it out because it's really, uh, it is really powerful. Because of the, the, very, the very things that they, they thought was not valuable, the very waste that they were leaving on the vines, ends up costing them all their money, all of their livestock, and all of their land. Mm. And it's all put into the power of Pharaoh. We could also take that today of saying that lots of times uh, there's a lot of people who live frivolously in today's society. They live, uh, they don't put anything back. They spend they spend more than they make lots of time and they're in debt with credit card debt with this and they just keep going and going and going like that. And if they would take this type of something, uh, you know, in, even in everybody's uh, everyday households, instead of overspending, not being wasteful, not uh, putting back for a rainy day like this was a rainy day, we could all take a little example of this from Joseph and say, you know, if we, whatever we have, we don't overspend it. We have our means of doing things. We could put things up and then if something was to happen to us, we'd have something saved mm -hmm. for, to pay for that, uh, that flat tire that happened. Yeah. Because you would have the money that you put back and you didn't waste it and spend it on something else. Or we would have money for you know, whatever means of things. It, it's a good business and a good uh, lesson for just us normal people today. If we mm -hmm. would take Joseph's advice in that, that God gave him then, he can gave us, give us the same knowledge and the same, uh, what do you would call it, uh, stewardship or the same uh, money plan or what's the word, Scott? Well, I mean, well, one, it's a lesson that I, I'm learning as I go, so uh, <laughs> I'm bad about it. I'm, I, hey, I'm going to admit my sin. I mean, you know, I'm not the best with money, and uh, that's why I don't handle the finance of the church, but, uh, you know, I'm not the best with money, but uh, it is a lesson that we can all learn, and it is something that we should apply to our lives. It, it is one of the things that's hard. Because, again, if we look at things through a biblical sense, you're absolutely correct, Teresa. God has provided enough for us to survive. Mm -hmm. But we want more. Mm -hmm. We always want more. We always want the, the, the shiny thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we go after the shiny thing, what happens is we end up putting ourselves into a jam. Yeah. 
And um, and what was good back then in that time frame is still good today. Absolutely. God's wisdom on that business plan is still a good business plan for us, mm -hmm. everybody. Yeah, and, and you know, if you look at the, the if you look at most of the wealthy, most of those that are like really wealthy, you know, yes, they have nice things, but they also have, like you said, they have the savings, they have they have stuff put back. You know, they, it may look like they're living frivolously, but they're actually very wise with their money. Yes, they can buy fancy things because they have a lot of money, but they're putting it back. They have excess. Yeah. So, um, as a matter of fact, I believe that they should each write us a check. <laughs> um, each individual in America should get a uh, get a, a twenty dollar check from everyone who's made over a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> I'm running for office, folks. Um, just kidding. Just kidding. Part for 2020. <laughs> yeah, 2020. <laughs> oh, um, Craig, Craig asked for prayer for his next door neighbor, Miss Cook, and her daughter, Linda Allen. Vera and Linda. All right, Craig said that we should be in prayer for Vera Cook and... It's Miss Cook and Linda Allen. And Linda Allen. Um, so... If we don't have any more questions or comments or concerns, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Next week, oh yeah, before we get into that, next week. Okay, I told y'all to remember something mm -hmm. in, uh, in the last section that we went over. Read chapter 42. Read chapter 43. And if someone will tell me... Um, what I said to remember next week, I'll give you an imaginary candy bar, just like I have everyone else, because I forgot to get it. So, anyway, let's go to the Lord and pray. Yes? Um, I was just going to say announcement. Do you want to announce that, what we're doing tomorrow? Oh, gosh, yes, yes. Before everybody goes On away. Wednesday, are you going to put Yeah, that, Wednesday, not Are you going to put it online? I will, I'm going to put it online on our BHB Facebook page. All right, on our BHB Facebook page, there is going to be a list of songs <laughs> for Wednesday. And we are going to do Christian karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to play the songs, the words are going to be up there, and whoever wants to get up and sing, we're going to sing and we're going to have a good time. I'm going to do a number. I don't know what yet. You can't do Purple Rain. I can't do Purple no, Rain. No, it's Christian I, songs. I can't do Express Yourself. I've already been told those two are <laughs> off the table. So, um, but we're going to do it. And guys, have fun with it. This is this is part of fellowship. You know, so many times when people walk into church, uh, and, and church is a place of, of reverence, a, a place of respect, but it's also a place of gathering for fun and fellowship. And this is an opportunity to have fun with your brothers and sisters in Christ. I think it's going to be great. Um, you know, like I said, I'm going to sing a number, and I can't sing at all. Maybe we can get Craig to sing something. Craig should sing. I, I feel like he should do, like, a, maybe a, a Tom Jones version of, uh, <laughs> of Swing Low or something. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, so that is what we're doing on Wednesday. What are we eating on Wednesday? Chicken nuggets and salad. <gasps> Chicken nuggets and salad. What do you think of that, Otis? That's good stuff, isn't it? Oh my gosh, look at this cute little baby. He loves his Grammy. <laughs> Grammy TT. Okay. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity that you've given us where we can gather and, sh and just share and receive your holy word, where we can discuss it, where we can ask questions, where we can... Seek the answers, Lord. Lord, we know that truth lies in these pages. Yet so many times we seek truth in so many other places when it's right in front of us, Lord. Lord, you have provided the answers. You have given us the map. You have given us the way to peace and prosperity, Lord. And that way is through you. May we listen to the words that you have given us. May we follow the instructions that you have put before us. And may we obey the commands that you have put in front of us, Lord, so that we can obtain peace. These things that you have given us are not for you because you don't need for anything. You just desire to see your people at peace. Lord, we thank you for the peace that you provided us here on earth. 
And Lord, we thank you for the peace that lies ahead when we are joined with you and put into our rightful place. Lord, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. 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 we got to come up with the name for the karaoke night. Holy Hump Day and karaoke. Ooh, that's going to be a good name. <laughs> I, <laughs> Craig, let me know when you say amen. When you don't sing along. <laughs> There we go. Bye, everybody. Bye, y'all.